remember and what I personally find cool. I don't know whether these have been studies that have necessarily impacted the field the most, but I think they're interesting, and so here we go. So this study is actually a year or two old. Um, it found that people with anorexia, um, it's actually women who had recovered from anorexia and had been recovered for a couple years. Um, they didn't find eating as rewarding as women who had never been ill. Um, so usually when you eat, your brain regis registers um, eating and, and tasting food as extremely pleasurable. This is a good thing because we need to eat to stay alive, and if we found eating not very fun, we probably wouldn't go out of our way to do it. So it has to be really pleasurable because when we're looking for food, typically in, in the animal world and even for early humans, is you are at pretty high risk of becoming dinner yourself. It was a dangerous prospect going out for food, so it had to be really pleasurable in order to have the drive to basically risk life in them to go find food. So, and most of the time, when, you know, they, they put this group of, of women, half of whom had recovered from anorexia, half of whom had never been ill, and they basically put them in a brain scanner and had them sip sugar water. And they looked at what areas of the brain became active when they sip the sugar water. And the healthy women, like expected, you know, their, their pleasure center showed, showed lots of activity. Um, and, but people who had recovered from anorexia didn't show the same response. It was much more blunted. Um, and so, I mean, there are lots of reasons as to how anorexia becomes self-perpetuating. Um, this isn't the, the total explanation, but it, it helps explain why even when food is very plentiful, why people with anorexia are able to keep starving themselves. It's because they don't have that same drive, because they don't quite get the same pleasure. Um, it's impossible to know whether this was an artifact of the disorder, whether this you know, decreased pleasure was the result of having had anorexia, or whether it had preceded the disorder. Um, the researchers believed that it probably had preceded the disorder, but there's really no way to tell, so that is one caveat. But um, it's an interesting hypothesis. Um, another one is, um, it's called the thin ideal internalization, and that there are genetic factors influencing this. Um, TII, as I called it, um, it's a measure of how much you agree with the cultural dictate that um, thin bodies are more attractive. Generally, people always thought this was very cultural because, of course, whether or not there's a thin ideal depends on your culture. Um, you know, as more and more countries have adopted Western technology, Western culture, is it's become a lot more universal. But um, it still, you know, it was still generally thought of as a fairly cultural thing as to whether or not you agree with it. You know, typically if someone thought you had a high degree of um, thin ideal internalization, it was due to, you know, your own psychology, it was due to, you know, whether you read magazines, whether your peers dieted, whether your family dieted, things like that. Is they, they really hadn't looked much at the genetics behind it. And so because they don't know, and because it's unlikely that there's going to be a single quote, quote, gene for something like thin ideal internalization, just like there is no single gene for anorexia or bulimia or EDNOS or binge eating disorder or any of that. Um, so what they did is they compared twins, and they can kind of tell roughly how much genetics contribute to whether one person, why one person has a high level of thin ideal internalization and another doesn't. Um, so they compared um, fraternal twins and identical twins. And basically, if something is more genetic, it would be much more likely that if your twin has it, that you will have it as well. And that's exactly what they found. Um, that, that bad body image really isn't just magazines and models. Um, that a lot, that some of the reason, at least for why some people have high levels of thin ideal internalization and others don't, is due to their genetics. And it, the researchers believe that this, they haven't tested it yet, but they're going to go back through and do another study, is that it might be related to things like um, perfectionism, um, things like body dysmorphia, and, and things like that. And that a lot of these genes that seem to be related to factors and, um, associated with eating disorders is that these genes seem to impact how the environment influences us rather than being a specific gene for anorexia or something. So a lot of um, the risk for eating disorders appears to be tied up in 
influencing how likely we are to be impacted by our environment.